Welcome to worship this morning, uh, again, in our, uh, our video ways that we have been worshiping together. Uh, we're glad that you're here, wherever you've come from, either our congregations or wherever you are, wherever you are participating in worship. We know that your voices and your prayers and your songs all join with us together this day. So we come together preparing ourselves to worship God. Welcome. Welcome again to this special celebration. This Sunday, we are celebrating Juneteenth. I know that that happens on June 19th. Um, in 1865, a word finally got to enslaved people in Galveston, Texas, that the war and the Emancipation Proclamation had been uh, proclaimed and given uh, two years before that. And uh, so those persons enslaved uh, yearned and prayed and waited for their freedom to be heralded. And so um, today we're going to kind of concentrate our service around that, around hearing the good news of liberation, hearing the good news of freedom, hearing the good news of joy, and finally being seen as a free human being worth, dig worth dignity and respect and value. And so we want you to uh, come into this worship experiencing um, all that history around us. A little later, we'll have a video explaining a little more, better than what I could. And we'll have some music, spirituals um, from the African-American community that we will sing together. So I invite you to welcome the Holy Spirit into this space as we gather together. Here this time, this beautiful, beloved, spiritual as our way to center ourselves. Oh. 
Let us be called to worship with these uh, words from Psalm 69 and words from another great spiritual woke up this morning. Um, so you will see those words uh, on the screen and feel free to sing along. Um, and Psalm 69 is our foundation for being called to worship this day. Save me, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck. I sink in deep mire where there is no foothold. I have come into deep waters and the flood sweeps over me. I am weary with my crying. My throat is parched. My eyes grow dim with waiting for God. More in number than the hairs of my head are those who hate me without cause. Many are those who would destroy me, my enemies who accuse me falsely. What I did not steal, must I now restore? Can't hate your neighbor with your mind and keep it stayed on Jesus. Can't hate your neighbor with your mind if you keep it stayed on Jesus. Can't hate your neighbor with your mind if you keep it. Answer me, O Lord, for your steadfast love is good. According to your abundant mercy, turn to me. Do not hide your face from your servant, for I am in distress. Make haste to answer me, draw near to me, redeem me, set me free because of my enemies. You know the insults I receive and my shame and dishonor. My foes are all known to you. Insults have broken my heart so that I am in despair. I looked for pity, but there was none, and for comforters, but I found none. Make you love everybody with your mind if you keep it stayed on Jesus. Makes you love everybody with your mind when you keep it stayed. Love everybody with your mind when you keep it stayed on Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. I will praise the name of God with a song. I will magnify God with thanksgiving. This will please the Lord more than an ox or a bull with horns and hooves. Let the oppressed see it and be glad. You who seek God, let your hearts revive. For the Lord hears the needy and does not despise God's own that are in bonds. Let heaven and earth praise God, the seas and everything that moves in them. For God will save Zion and rebuild the cities of Judah, and God's servants shall live there and possess it children of God shall inherit it, and those who love God's name shall live in it. Oh, I woke up this morning with my mind, and it was stayed on Jesus. Well, I woke up this morning with my mind, and it was stayed on Jesus. I woke up this morning with my mind. Hallelujah. 
join me in this opening prayer. Holy, liberating God, you have made your faithfulness known from generation to generation. Throughout the biblical story, we hear again and again how you have continued to rescue your people, releasing them from bondage in order that they might live fully and freely as your children. We remember Moses and the Exodus. We remember the cycles of deliverance and repentance under the judges. We remember the prophets and the returns from exile. And we remember how all of these have made known your generous love for the least of these. We recall most of all how you entered this story in the flesh, releasing us from our sins through Jesus Christ's life, death, and resurrection. You reconciled us with yourself, and in doing so, you call us to be reconciled with one another. Through the Holy Spirit, you continue to tear down the dividing walls of hostility that separate us from each other and distort your gospel. Liberating God, we add our voices and to the generations that have gone before us in giving thanks for the freedom you brought in the United States when you brought slavery to a legal end. Over 200 years of European Americans shipping and trading African peoples as if they were disposable goods distorted our experience of your image, both in those enslaved and in those who enslaved others. Yet you have a mystery, a history of overcoming our most dehumanizing abuses of each other. Even when we legalize our abuses through our words of law and government sanctioned violence. Thank you for raising up faithful servants of your kingdom who boldly and prophetically embodied your gospel spending themselves on behalf of those enslaved. Thank you for not abandoning us to our destructive ways. Thank you for releasing us from the legalized injustices we have inflicted upon each other. Thank you for your mercy and compassion, O oh God. Give us the courage to continue the liberating work for all of your children. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's join together as we sing that great spiritual, there's a great camp meeting in the promised land. Walk together, children, don't you get weary. Walk together, children, don't you get weary. Walk together, children, don't you get weary. There's a great camp meeting in the promised land. Oh, walk together, children, don't you get weary. Walk together, children, don't you get weary. Walk together, children, don't you get weary. There's a great camp meeting in the promised land. Together, children, don't you get weary? Talk together, children, don't you get weary? Talk together, children, don't you get weary? There's a great camp meeting in the promised land. Gonna sing another time, sing another time, sing another time. There's a great camp meeting in the promised land. Oh, sing together, children. Don't you get weary? Sing together, children. Don't you get weary? Sing together, children. Don't you get weary? There's a great camp meeting in the promised land. Oh, walk together, children. Don't you get weary? Walk together, children. Don't you get weary? Walk together, children. Don't you get weary? There's a great camp meeting in the promised land.
This world is one great battlefield With forces all array If in my heart I do not yield I'll overcome someday I'll overcome If in my heart I do not yield, I'll overcome someday. Like the Civil War itself, slavery didn't end with one decisive act. After the Battle of Antietam in September 1862, President Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation in January 1863. It declared all persons held as slaves within the rebellious states to be free. Northern abolitionists welcomed the proclamation as a first step, while Southern slave owners ignored it. Ending slavery would take a constitutional amendment passed in January 1865, Robert E. Lee's surrender at Appomattox in April 1865, the heroism of many enslaved families, and the Union Army itself to personally deliver the news to the most remote corners of the conquered Confederacy. The proclamation that Lincoln signed didn't find its way into Texas, which is where my father's family is from and the Rambo family, until mid-June of 1865. On June 19th, Union General Gordon Granger arrived in Galveston and personally delivered the news. The people of Texas are informed that, in accordance with the proclamation from the Executive of the United States, all slaves are free. This involves an absolute equality of personal rights and rights of property between former masters and slaves, and the connection heretofore existing between them becomes that between employer and hired labor. There was a, a lot of celebration, but there was also a lot of sadness, a lot of concern, a lot of fear both enslaved Africans and those who held slaves didn't know what really to do now. As freed Americans, where were we to go? <laughs> 150 years later, June 19th is a day of remembrance and celebration. I think my first Juneteenth celebration was when I was six or seven because I remember roasted ears of corn. And this was in Austin, Texas. And then coming here, I was surprised and really astounded to find out that Minneapolis, St. Paul have such a strong connection with Juneteenth. It stands to reason with the number of people who probably migrated from this far north who brought with them that tradition. Every year in Texas, Minnesota, and around the country, Juneteenth is marked with music, food, and fellowship. We are celebrating at Mississippi Regional Park. There's all ages here. I just see all kinds of people and colors. <laughs> it's amazing to me that, especially among uh, the African American culture, we have a little bit of a fear of, of embracing that history, you know, because there's some shame connected to slavery. I don't feel that way. I feel that that is such an important part of who I am as a person. The strength that I have within me comes from that struggle. African American Independence Day. So we're celebrating yep. our day of liberation, our day of liberation. It's important to have opportunities for us to celebrate our oneness, our wholeness, our completeness, our dynamic selves. It's vital to African American people to have a an opportunity, a date, that heralds the importance of who we are as a people, what we've been through as a people. Juneteenth gives African American communities a chance to reflect on their ancestors' struggles and achievements, and also to spotlight current issues. There is a lot going on in this world. There's a lot of anger, a lot of frustration, and a lot of uneasiness. The foundation you have can kind of give you a little bit more of a sure footing because you can look and say, well, wait, my family made it through this hatred. Somehow they made it through. Yeah. So take that strength and go up to the next level. I love seeing the support 
that I get every year. It's always new people I'm meeting and hopefully collaborating with them so we can have Juneteenth and not let it die. It's so important. If in my heart I do not yield, I'll overcome someday. reading from the writings of the Apostle Paul to the Romans, Romans 6, verses 1 through 11. So to what are we going to say? Should we continue sinning so grace will multiply? Absolutely not. All of us died to sin. How can we still live in it? Or don't you know that all who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried together with him through baptism into his death, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of God, we too can walk in the newness of life. If we were united together in a death like this, we will also be united together in a resurrection like his. This is what we know. The person that we used to be was crucified with him in order to get rid of the corpse that had been controlled by sin. That way, we wouldn't be slaves to sin anymore because a person who has died has been freed from sin's power. But if we died with Christ, we have faith that we will also live with him. We know that Christ has been raised from the dead and he will never die again. Death no longer has power over him. He died to sin once and for all with his death, but he lives for God with his life. In the same way, you should also consider yourselves dead to sin, but alive for God in Christ Jesus, the word of God for all people. Let's sing together another wonderful spiritual, It's Me, It's Me, O Lord, Standing 
in the need of prayer. these words from the gospel according to St. Matthew in the 10th chapter, beginning with verse 28 through verse 39. Jesus says, Do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny, yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from God. And even the hairs of your head are all counted, so do not be afraid. You are of more value than many sparrows. Everyone, therefore, who acknowledges me before others, I also will acknowledge before God in heaven. But whoever denies me before others, I will also Deny before my Abba God in heaven. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I've not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and one's foes will be members of one's own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves sons or daughters more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take up the cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Those who find their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake will find it. Here ends our reading from Matthew's Gospel, the word of God for all people. Thanks Thanks be to God. God. So this is rather unexpected. Jesus says, I didn't come to bring peace, but a sword. It's kind of daunting words, kind of confusing. Jesus goes on to talk about Whoever doesn't leave father or mother or daughter or son to follow after him is not worthy. 
Whoever does not take up the cross and follow is not worthy of me. This whole thing about finding your life, you have to lose it. And if you lose your life, then you find it. What's going on? What is Jesus talking about? I find it interesting that at this moment that we are in, during this time when we are basically separated from one another, most of the time we are in our homes, most of the time we are going to just where we need to go and coming right back to our homes, and we've been pretty isolated from each other. But I wonder if this is also a time for us to do some real deep searching about what Jesus means about following after the cross, about losing our lives, about finding our lives. A good search always requires a good map. If you're going to go on a journey, you kind of want to bring some tools with you. If you're going to go on a seek and find kind of thing, you kind of want to bring some elements that will help you do some of that searching. It seems that Jesus is alerting us or giving us a little bit of some travel companionship reading that we need to do. Who said that peace is the absence of tension? That peace is not struggle? Who said that having the courage to be a peacemaker means having the courage to also make us feel uncomfortable. It seems to me that Jesus is reminding us and reminding his disciples that those who seek to find peace will find struggle too. Because peace is not cheap. Peace is not something that just comes by just because you and I sing Kumbaya together. Peace is something worth the commitment to stay the course even when that course gets difficult and tensions rise and it doesn't feel like peace at all. can imagine those who waited for the news, those who waited enslaved wondering if something was happening in the nation, unawares that Lincoln had already announced two years before that freedom of all enslaved persons was a reality. Now, we know that just because Lincoln declared that, it doesn't mean that it was done. In fact, the story goes that they probably didn't get the news in Texas because, well, the plantation owners wanted one more crop. So they waited. They waited. There's a verse in scripture that says, those who wait on the Lord will renew their strength. Man, there is a lot to learn from our ancestors who waited in the midst of strife, in the midst of struggle, in the midst of difficulty, because peace only comes to those who wait in the midst of strife. Peace comes to those who choose to follow 
Jesus, even if it means a cross. And a cross is not very peaceful. But those who wait, as they waited, sang songs in the morning of that Juneteenth day about God, the God who watches the sparrow that can bring liberation to all God's people. As I've been looking at the scripture, I'm, I'm struck by the um, opposites that are in this text. There are lots of different places where Jesus places two things there that are, are opposites. The sparrow, the hairs on your head. Not opposites, but it makes me nervous about the hairs on <laughs> my head these days. Earlier, uh, just before the, where we started to read the scripture, he talks about disciple and teacher, about master and slave, about um, um, from above versus like. And here, he's talking about, in one place, fear. Fear of those who can take away your body. Fear versus them. So have no fear of them, he says. Have no fear of them. Dark versus light, body versus soul. These are all here in this text. Peace versus the sword. Hmm. Lydia and I had some conversation about what that means. It's a, it's a text that, that um, is often troubling to people, right? Um, we think of Jesus as bringing peace, but he says peace. I don't bring peace. I bring a sword. And a sword is not necessarily something that you and I might think of as a, as a long, uh, a long Excalibur. Excalibur, right? The, uh, the, uh, the Scottish, um, um, man, I'm blanking. I just lost my Scottish card right there. Uh, William but Wallace. <laughs> the William Wallace sword. Not just those swords or the rapiers that we use in fencing, but that word also means a knife, mm -hmm. a knife used to divide things, mm -hmm. to divide meat, to divide what's in front of you. Mm. And it's pretty clear that when Jesus reminds us that when he's here, he might very well cause father to be against son and mother to be against daughter and, and daughter to be against mother-in-law, mm. against sons and daughters. Mm. And that very well might happen. There are so many times um, during these past few months that I've wondered about fear. What are we afraid of? Afraid of the virus that's in our midst. Indeed, we are. I am. I know. Anxious about it. But then I find myself, as I make my way, creeping out my back door to my car, looking around to see if there are other people there. And when I go to the grocery store, wondering behind those other masks, should I be afraid? Should I be afraid? Jesus says, have no fear. Hmm. Now, that doesn't mean to me, stop wearing your mask. It means be calm in your spirit. Let your soul be okay. Hmm. And we've... Lydia and I have taken um, a few risks this, these past few weeks and have been part of some demonstrations in the midst of, of the unrest that we have all seen and heard and mm. experienced. And I know when we stand out there, it, suddenly it occurs to me that this ridiculous division that we have created amongst people is not from God. Because in those demonstrations, there are all kinds of people. Mm -hmm. There are young and old and black and brown and white and all kinds of people. 
And they are saying to each other what God is saying to us. Do not fear each other. Do not fear each other. Come to some kind of peace, that peace which I give you. Jesus talks about peace that's beyond our understanding at this moment. And it is, yet we strive for it, don't we? Peace. Some of his last words to us, my peace I leave with you. It's time to accept that peace as a part of who we are and see in each other, see in each other, not them, but see in each other God's image. Hmm. Jesus comes to remind us of that, that each of us is created in the likeness of God. If we could only accept that, if we only could accept that, Maybe we'll find some peace. Amen. Amen. Now, friends, as we gather together to continue our worship through our offering and our tithing this morning, I ask you to give, give from your heart, give in ways that are over in abundance, freely, generously to the work of bringing peace. We offer our gifts, our financial gifts, our prayers, all of our gifts. We offer them to God. So this morning, as you are in prayer, find those gifts within yourself and look for the ways around you to serve God by serving your neighbor. Let us give as God has given to us. Didn't my Lord deliver Daniel? Then why not every man? Didn't my Lord deliver Daniel? Yes, deliver Daniel. Yes, deliver Daniel. Didn't my Lord deliver Daniel? Yes, deliver Why not every man? the lion's den, Jonah from the belly of the whale, and the Hebrew children from the fiery furnace, and why not every man? Yes, 
delivered Daniel. Yes, delivered Daniel. He delivered, didn't he? he delivered Daniel. Yes, from the lions then. From the belly of the whale and the Hebrew children, from the fiery furnace of every man. Yes, he did. Oh yes. Why? Every man. Yes, he did. Deliver Daniel from the As we gather in prayer, prayer for each other, prayer for our community, prayer for our world, I want to bring us to also pray as our Council of Bishops has invited the whole entire denomination to enter into this time of prayer, but an intentional time. This uh, campaign, if you will, called Dismantling Racism, Pressing Toward freedom, pressing toward the freedom of God. And so we are going to enter into a time, it's actually going to be a year and a half of work, of prayer, of worship uh, experiences, of different ways for you and I to engage in the work of dismantling racism. We have decided as a denomination not to just uh, placate uh people with nice words about racism or maybe nice prayers about racism, but actually entering and doing the work, you know, the kind of work that takes place across the kitchen table or the kind of work that takes place when you, um, you know, hear something that is not uh, right, that you say uh, something about it. So um, they are inviting us to pray starting in July. There are two times that we are going to pray at 846 in the morning and at 846 in the evening. 30 seconds, a minute, I don't know, you could work towards doing eight minutes, if you want, of prayer. Um, and this is to keep in memory the, uh, uh, the murder of George Floyd um, that took that amount of time. And so our bishops are asking us to enter into solidarity with that. Um, and there's also going to be an online worship experience from across the country, um, from various places, calling us into worship, a time of repentance, of lament, of communion and confession. And so we are going to uh, participate with that on uh, July, uh, June 24th. And I will have a watch party going on on Facebook as well as other places that you can access that um, so that you are, can participate in that and enter in together. Of all the times that our denomination comes together. This is a powerful time. What a witness. What a witness we can give to the world who sees United Methodists standing against racism. Let us pray. <laughs>
So we didn't forget dads. It's Father's Day. Um, and so uh, just as we had for Mother's Day, included a, a video and a, a song. Um, we have uh, found this litany of peace for Father's Day, which comes from the General Board of Discipleship uh, from their website. So we'll pray that and invite you to pray along with it um, responsively, a litany of peace for Father's Day. And that will be followed by a very brief uh, video, a prayer for fathers um, from the United Methodist Church, uh, fathers from different places around our denomination around the world. So it's a very brief uh, prayer, video prayer. So please uh, pray with us first in this litany of litany uh, for Father's Day, litany of peace for Father's Day. Let us pray. Lord God, we lift this day our gratitude for the loving men who have brought us the precious heart of your nurturing love. We give thanks to you this day. For those who have shown us kindness, for those who have shown us courage, for those who have shown us generosity, for those who have shown us truth, for those who have shown us compassion, for those who have shown us faith, for those who have shown us love. Blessed be the name of all sons and brothers and fathers who reveal a glimpse of your loving presence on earth, O oh God, you inspire your people in the ways of kindness that lift our world from its disgrace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer for every son, brother, father, grandfather who has suffered and endured. Hear our prayer, O oh God, for this broken world. We pray for peace this Father's Day. For wisdom and equity in the hearts and minds of those who lead us. For justice with mercy that seeks equitable access to the earth's resources. For passion and power in our churches to influence public policy for good. For a new day when justice will roll down like waters across this land. For the revelation of your compassionate love that never leaves nor forsakes. And we lift your hope of healing for all sons and brothers, fathers and grandfathers who live in mystery as your creation, who are entrusted with the life and struggles of manhood. May they grow in your healing love to your glory. Hear our prayer, O God, for this broken world. We pray for peace this Father's Day and every day. Amen. Amen. Loving God, we give thanks for the men of virtue who have touched our lives, those who have shown us kindness, courage, generosity, truth, compassion, faith, and love. Bless all sons and brothers and fathers and grandfathers who reveal a glimpse of your loving presence on earth. Amen. So, we come to a close in our worship time, and I invite you to sing this song. You're going to have to stand or sit if you want to, but I have a feeling you're going to want to move something, <laughs> whether it's your hands or tap your feet, whatever it is. Um, this is from the Little Feet International Children's Choir, and it requires some moves. So there's a part where we um, sing Leaning on the Everlasting Arms, and the children will invite you to lean and lean on Jesus, safe and secure from all alarm. Will you join them? I want to add something to that. Lydia didn't expect me to say anything, but, um, <laughs> but this is a, uh, a song that I actually um, ended one of my sermons with uh, many years ago, and um, it was a sermon about my dad. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
it was called a leg to stand on. My dad only had one leg, and I ended with leaning on the everlasting arms. <laughs> and the senior pastor said to me, wow, did you mean to do that? I said, well, yeah, I meant to do that, <laughs> leaning on the everlasting arms. So on this Father's Day, it brings that memory back to me. So we all nice. lean on, uh, on God's arms. Yes, we do. As worship comes to a close, we invite you to be blessed by God in however God blesses you throughout your life, but receive this blessing and benediction as we depart this day. As we go from here, remember this. As followers of Jesus Christ, we have not received a spirit of fear, but one of hope and confidence. For we are children of God, members of God's own family, and heirs with Jesus Christ himself. So go out with joy to love and serve the Lord. And as you go, remember the scripture says, I have come to bring a sword between mother and daughter, son and father, mother-in-law and son-in-law, and the list goes on. It seems like our kids today are speaking loudly to the church. We've been talking for a long time about how we want young people in our churches. We want young people to take on leadership. We want young people to move us to the next step forward. Well, maybe, maybe they are. Are we willing to follow this day as you go forth? Are you listening? Freedom is coming. Yes, freedom. Go in God's freedom. Amen. Amen.